How strong do your lats need to be to hold a front lever? What about your front delts to hold a planche? In this video, I'm going to attempt to clarify the biomechanics of these exercises. But before I begin, I just wanted to warn you that I made a lot of assumptions and simplifications in my math, so please take it with a grain of salt. First, let's look at a screenshot of me holding the front lever. As you can see, the angle of my arm relative to my torso is roughly 49 degrees. Based on the fact that my body doesn't move, I can assume that the sum of forces on my body is equal to zero. From here, I assume that my body experiences no forces in the horizontal direction, meaning that gravity exerts a 162 pound downward force on me, and the bar exerts a 162 pound upward force on me. I'm sure many of you would have already guessed this based on intuition, but I just wanted to establish this before moving forward. From here, I separated this downward force into two components, an axial component and a tangential component. I did this because I know that there's two movement patterns involved in holding a front lever, shoulder extension and shoulder retraction. Shoulder extension causes rotation of the upper arm in the sagittal plane of the body, and shoulder retraction causes the shoulder blades to move horizontally in the same plane. I assumed any force applied to the bar through shoulder extension would be directed in a force perpendicular to the axis of your arm, and any force applied to the bar through shoulder retraction would be directed in the same direction as your arm. I know this sounds a bit counterintuitive since when we think of retraction, we imagine pure horizontal translation of the scapula. However, I figured that the most logical way to balance out the horizontal force generated by shoulder extension is for the shoulder retraction force to point axially along the arm. Now that I've established that the vertical force applied in the front lever can be broken down into two forces which point axially and tangentially relative to your arm, I can isolate the force on the pull-up bar due to shoulder extension and shoulder retraction. Since the net force I applied to the pull-up bar is 162 pounds in the vertical direction, I can use geometry to separate this force into an axial and tangential component. As a result, I found that the axial force I need to exert on the bar is 122 pounds, and the tangential force I need to exert is 106 pounds. Since both arms exert an equal force on the bar, the axial and tangential forces applied through a single arm are 61 and 53 pounds. Assuming the lats are the only muscle responsible for shoulder extension, we can calculate the force they need to exert on the humerus to counteract the moment due to a 53 pound tangential force. As you can see, the lat tendon attaches to the upper arm like so. Assuming my arm is about 2 feet long, and my lat tendon inserts into my arm 2 inches from the shoulder at a 90 degree angle, that means my lat has a mechanical advantage of 1 to 12, which is pretty bad. So even though it only needs to counteract a moment due to a 53 pound force, it has to produce 12 times the force to do so, or 638 pounds. At this point, I got pretty confused. After all, if I'm experiencing a 53 pound force at my hands and 638 pounds of force at my lat tendon insertion, there has to be a third external force with a magnitude of 585 pounds acting at my shoulder. This is because the sum of external forces acting on a static body must equal zero. In this case, the body I'm analyzing includes the upper arm, the lower arm, and the hands. I thought about it for a long time, and I attributed this 585 pound force to the rotator cuff, specifically the subscapularis, which pulls the humerus forward, as well as the bones and passive structures surrounding the glenohumeral joint. From here, I approximated the area of the lat tendon attachment to the humerus as 187 square millimeters, and found the stress on the lat tendon to be 14 megapascals, which is less than the yielding stress of tendons I found online, which is 50 to 150 megapascals. However, it should be noted that such a high stress value can cause failure of the lat tendon over time through fatigue, especially since tendons take longer to recover than muscles. This also applies to other tendons in the back such as the rear delts, teres major, traps and rhomboids, and rotator cuff. As for the traps and rhomboids, I considered that they exert force onto the scapula similarly to a pulley. In a pulley, force is conserved but the direction of force changes. Similarly, the traps and rhomboids contract along the frontal plane of the body, pulling the scapula inward. The rotator cuff muscles transmit this force to the humerus, and then the bones of the arm transmit this to the hands. As for the mechanical advantage of the traps and rhomboids, I know that an ideal pulley has a mechanical advantage of one, but intuitively I feel like that isn't the case here. There's just a lot of muscles that orient in different directions along this pulley system, so there's probably a significant loss of energies from the traps and rhomboids to the hands. At the end of the day, I wasn't sure how to mathematically approximate the mechanical advantage of the traps and rhomboids, so I'll just ignore that for now. 
Since I had an idea of how much force my lats need to generate in the front lever, I decided to compare this to the force my lats need to generate in a pull-up isometric at the same shoulder angle. Assuming that my upper and lower arms are both one foot long, I found that in a regular pull-up, my lats need to produce 720 pounds of force to counteract the moment at my shoulder generated by the 162 pound force at my hands. This is less than the force required in the front lever since the lever arm of my hands is shorter in the pull-up. In order to produce the same tension in my lats as the front lever, I calculated that I'd have to add an additional 121 pounds of weight to my pull-up. Honestly, this is probably an overestimate since the rear delts contribute quite significantly to the front lever but not as much in the weighted pull-up, which means that I would probably need less than 120 pounds of extra weight to be able to produce the same amount of lat tension in the pull-up as in the front lever. This is further supported by the fact that when I held my first 8 second front lever, I was doing weighted pull ups with around 20 pounds for sets of 10, which correlates to a 1RM of 70 pounds in the weighted pull up. In case you're curious about how the axial and tangential forces in the front lever change with different shoulder angles, I plotted them on MATLAB as a function of body weight. As the angle increases from 40 to 60 degrees, the axial force decreases from 77 to 50% of my body weight, while the tangential force increases from 64 to 87% of my body weight. As you can see, this graph suggests that for very small shoulder angles in the front lever, the force I'd have to generate in shoulder retraction would be very small. But if that were true, then in an exercise like the touch front lever, my traps and rhomboids wouldn't be activated at all. I knew this couldn't be true because when I train the touch front lever, I feel a lot of stress in my mid back. This made me confused for a long time, but I soon realized what the issue was. For very small shoulder angles, the rear delts take on a more dominant role in shoulder extension than the lats. This is important because the rear delts insert into the scapula, unlike the lats which connect directly to the spine. When activated, the rear delts pull the scapula down and away from the center of the body. To counteract this force, the traps and rhomboids must produce a force up and towards the center of the body. As a result, for very narrow shoulder angles in the front lever, the role of the traps and rhomboids changes from producing an axial force along the arm to counteracting the force that the rear delts exert on the scapula. This also applies to the teres major, which inserts into the humerus right next to the lat. The teres major pulls the scapula outwards, and the traps and rhomboids resist this force by pulling inwards. In case you're curious about the mechanical advantage of the rear delts, I assume that the rear delt inserts into the humerus 6 inches from the shoulder at a 30 degree angle. As a result, the rear delts have a mechanical advantage of 1 to 8. Lastly, I wanted to analyze the stress going through the medial epicondyl in the front lever. Looking at the force on the hand, you can see that there's a 53 pound tangential force applied to the hand from the pull-up bar. This causes a moment about the wrist. Assuming the force due to the wrist flexor acts at the same location at a 5 degree angle, then the wrist flexor must exert 608 pounds of force to resist the moment due to the 53 pound force from the bar. Assuming all of this force gets transmitted to the medial epicondyl, and assuming the medial epicondyl has a diameter of 0.5 inches, then the stress at this location is 15 megapascals. In addition to the force that the wrist flexor needs to exert to resist the 53 pound tangential force, the wrist flexor also needs to apply a compressive force to the pull-up bar through finger flexion in order to create friction. This friction keeps your hand from slipping from the bar. Unfortunately, it's kind of hard for me to represent the wrist flexors well with math because unlike the lat tendon, they don't insert at a fixed point on the hand. They extend all the way until the fingers, and in addition to this, you can flex your wrists and fingers independently of each other, even though they're controlled by the same muscles. This makes it hard for me to draw an accurate point force on the hand because I can't really tell where the wrist flexors are exerting force, if that makes sense. If I had a better understanding, maybe I could expand on this to investigate the mechanical advantage of the wrist flexors in a false grip versus a regular overgrip, but from what I understand about the front lever in general, the false grip makes the front lever both easier and harder. First, it reduces the effective length of the arm, which improves the mechanical advantage of the lats. But at the same time, the false grip causes the shoulder angle to decrease, which puts the lats in a shortened range of motion. Due to the decrease in shoulder angle, the moment due to the tangential force that your lats have to offset is increased, and the lats themselves are in a more shortened position, which they're probably weaker in. So using a false grip in a regular front lever is a bit of a trade-off in terms of overall strength. Now that we've talked about the front lever, let's look at the planche. Initially, I assumed that my planche analysis would be the same as the front lever, only that the arm angle might change a little bit. This is because in the planche, most people tend to fully protract their shoulders, whereas in the front lever, people tend to slightly retract their shoulders. This causes the effective length of their arm to change, and thus changes the shoulder angle by a bit. From here, the force that we attribute to the lats in the front lever would simply change to the front delts in the planche, and the force attributed to the traps and rhomboids in the front lever would change to the serratus anterior. 
As a result, my theoretical planche forces would be 106 pounds in the tangential direction and 122 pounds in the axial direction. From here, I tried to approximate the force that my front delt tendons need to exert on my humeri in order to counteract the moment generated by the 106 pound tangential force. Assuming my entire arm and shoulder is 2 feet long, and that my front delt tendon attaches 6 inches from my shoulder at a 30 degree angle, that means the mechanical advantage of my front delt is 1 to 8. So to counteract the moment due to a 106 pound tangential force, my front delt would have to exert an 850 pound force on my humerus. In order for the sum of forces on my arm to add to zero, there must be a 744 pound force acting at the shoulder, which I attributed to the posterior muscles of the rotator cuff, as well as the bones and passive structures of the glenohumeral joint. From here, I calculated the stress on the anterior insertion of a single deltoid tendon. Assuming an area of 100 square millimeters, the front delt tendon experiences a stress of 19 megapascals, which is pretty similar to the lat tendon. From here, I calculated that in a handstand push-up isometric at a 49 degree shoulder angle, my front delts need to generate 480 pounds of force. Surprisingly, I also found that in order to produce the same force in the handstand push-up as the planche, I'd have to overhead press my body weight plus an additional 121 pounds, similarly to the pull-up. This was a big red flag to me because I know for a fact that you don't need to overhead press anywhere near 280 pounds to hold a planche. I thought about it for a while, and I realized there was a big issue with my math. I didn't account for the fact that the bicep assists in shoulder flexion. This is because the long head and short head of the bicep insert onto the scapula rather than the humerus. As a result, they can contribute significantly to shoulder flexion in the planche. From here, I tried recalculating the forces in the planche in order to account for the biceps, but I ran into some issues. If I were to look at the moment about my arm, I would have two unknowns, the moment due to the front delts and the moment due to the biceps. Since I only have one equation, I can't solve it. If I account for the sum of forces in the axial and tangential directions of my arm, I would have four unknowns this time, the magnitude of the bicep tension, the magnitude of the front delt tension, and the magnitude and direction of the reaction force at the glenohumeral joint. This is a problem because I only have three equations the sum of moments about the shoulder, and the sum of forces in the axial and tangential directions of the arm. If I were to assume a direction for the net force acting at the glenohumeral joint, I could solve this system of equations, but I don't think I can do that here because there's more than one contributor to this reaction force. There's the compression of the glenohumeral joint itself, and there's the rotator cuff that stabilized the head of the humerus. At this point, I thought maybe I could try looking at a free body diagram of the lower arm in order to figure out the amount of tension in the biceps, but this just made it more complicated. In this case, I had even more unknowns, namely the magnitudes and directions of the forces due to the biceps, brachioradialis, brachialis, and the reaction force at the elbow joint itself. The problem here is that there's three main muscles which contribute to elbow flexion, which creates even more unknowns. At this point, I kind of wanted to give up, but I had one last strategy, the bicep tear. Most bicep tears in the planche occur at the distal or proximal bicep tendons during supinated planche progressions. Assuming that the yielding stress of the bicep tendon is 50 megapascals, and the bicep tendon fails at 50% of its yielding stress due to fatigue, as well as the area of the distal bicep tendon insertion being 100 square millimeters, that means the force going through the distal bicep tendon is about 2500 newtons or 560 pounds. Now, you might be thinking that from here, I could use this to solve my earlier system of equations, and I agree. After all, if we assume that the bicep inserts one inch below the elbow at a five degree angle, and we assume that the bicep tendon exerts 560 pounds of force on the radius, then this creates a 630 pound inch moment about the shoulder. Since the moment due to the tangential force at one of the hands is 1272 pound inches, that means the moment due to a single front delt is 638 pound inches. From here, I get that the tension in both of the front delts is 425 pounds. This is less than the force required in the handstand push-up, so I'm pretty sure this is an underestimate of the actual force required in the front delts. I can make this value larger by assuming that the bicep tendon insertion has a smaller cross-section, or that it inserts into the radius at a smaller angle. But to be honest, just getting somewhat close to a reasonable answer required a lot of work on my part and a lot of assumptions, so I'm gonna leave it here. Before I close this video, I want to talk about tendons and how they tear. When I first started researching this topic, I didn't have a good theoretical understanding of why tendons tear at stretched muscle lengths. What I realized in this video is that the mechanical advantage of muscle changes at different muscle lengths. For example, when the elbow is fully extended, the bicep tendon inserts almost parallel to the radius, whereas when the bicep is flexed, the tendon inserts almost perpendicularly to the radius. As a result, the mechanical advantage of the flexed arm position is much greater than the straight arm position. 
To clarify this, if we assume that the bicep inserts into the radius at a 5 degree angle in the stretched arm position, and that it inserts into the radius at a 90 degree angle in the bent arm position, then the mechanical advantage of the bicep in each position is 1 to 39 versus 1 to 3.3. Because of this, the bicep has to produce 10 times more tension in the straight arm position in order to produce the same moment about the bicep in the bent arm position. This large amount of tension makes the straight arm position rather dangerous. In addition to this, at straight arm positions, notice how the tendon attaches to the bone. As you can see, a lot of the axial force going through the tendon gets transmitted into the tendon insertion in the form of a transverse or shearing direction. Many materials fail through shear stress before peer tension. This shearing component may cause the tendon to fail at lower stress values than its yielding stress. In addition to this, you can see that further down in the arm, the tendon is more stretched, whereas closer to the elbow, the tendon is less stretched. So I think that this extra stretching component can cause a dangerous stress gradient because tendons aren't really supposed to stretch. They're supposed to be pretty fixed in uh, length, but you can see that here, the far end, the tendon gets stretched. That could thin out the tendon and also just cause a larger tension at that area, which would basically be increasing the stress at the tendon by two factors. Anyways, that's the end of my analysis. As you can tell, this video took a lot of work. I thought about this almost every day for two weeks. And there's even a calculation that I didn't include in this video, which is basically where I tried to solve the stress in the medial elbow by assuming a beam bending problem. And I like tried catting out the cross section of the elbow and then I plugged in like the materials as like tendon, bone, and muscle using their um, Young's moduli and densities. But like with the mass moment of inertia that I ended up getting, I found that the stress on the elbow was like way off. I think it was like too small to make sense. But yeah, yeah, this was a pretty cool video. I'm excited because I feel like this is one of the first videos I've ever made that adds something completely new to the calisthenics community. And that makes me happy. If you enjoyed it, um, which, you know, it's hard to say you enjoyed math, but I'm glad. Have a good one, guys. Bye.